Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 32 of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. Thank you. I wanted to begin today's episode by thanking you for being such an awesome Ben Franklin's World community member. All of your efforts to spread word of our show, either by word of mouth or social media shares, have been incredible. We're helping so many people better understand our early American past, and I know together we're going to create a better future because of that. As you know, history is just important, and your efforts have been beyond fantastic. So thank you so much. I also wanted to thank you for all of your emails. You have so many wonderful recommendations for future episodes or things I can do to improve the show, and I really appreciate that. I also really appreciate it when you send me your questions, because I love to get them. You know, what are you interested in in early America? That's going to help drive the future of this show. So thank you for taking the time to do that. In fact, I'm really excited about today's episode because it offers an opportunity to help answer your most asked question. What was daily life like for early American men and women? Today we speak with Michelle Marchetti Coughlin. She's an historian of early American women's history and author of One Colonial Woman's World, The Life and Writings of Mehetable Chandler Coit. Now, Mehetable Coit was an average woman from a well-to-do but not wealthy early New England family. She's also the author of the earliest known diary kept by an early American woman. Now, what does that mean? Mehetable began her diary in the late 17th century. At present, historians do not know of any other diary that exists that was kept by a colonial American woman and begins earlier than Mehetable's diary. During our conversation, Michelle reveals who Mehetable Chandler Coit was and why her diary is special. We just talked about the periodization, but that's not the only reason why Mehetable's diary is special. What Mehetable's diary or life record reveals about the lives and interests of colonial American women and the types of daily work or chores early New England women performed to keep their households running. I know you're really excited about this topic too, so let's get to it. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Michelle Marchetti Coughlin is an independent scholar specializing in early American women's history, and she is the author of One Colonial Woman's World, The Life and Writings of Mehetable Chandler Coit. Michelle was a 2013 Massachusetts Humanities Scholar-in-Residence at the Westport Historical Society. She currently serves on the board of the Abigail Adams Birthplace and as the museum administrator of the Gibson House Museum in Boston's Back Bay. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Michelle. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm excited you could join us because One Colonial Woman's World really sheds light on what daily life was like for women and families in colonial New England, and not just in the 18th century, but in the 17th century as well. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and how you became interested in early American women's history? Sure. Um, Well, I've always been interested in history, and early on, I was particularly interested in 19th century history. But then I took a class with Sack Van Berkovich, and it was on the Puritans, and that really helped me see the Puritans in a new way. And I was just fascinated by them as a people. They're so complex. Um, There are so many writings, uh, their writings that have been left behind. And I'm also just very interested in that period of American history because, you know, with the settlers coming over from England and there are all these different ideas here and all of this change and it's really, it is a new frontier. So I'm very interested in that period. And I became interested in women's history. Um, I was pretty much always interested in women's history, but I was just dismayed when I was studying this early period to discover just how few um, 
women's writings were available for study, but also how few women from this period had been studied. And I believe there's still, you know, it's getting better. More and more people are studying early American women, but they, there's still a lot of work to do, I think. And I think the, you know, we just, this, this period is kind of still dominated by male narratives. And I think if you're not hearing stories about women and people of color from this period, you're just really not getting the full picture of early American life. And it seems one of the things that hinders scholarship on early American women is the fact that not aren't necessarily a lot of records left behind. And it, in particular, it seems that diaries kept by women during the 17th and early 18th centuries are really rare finds. And yet you managed to find one. So how did you discover Mehetable's diary? Uh, yeah, so I was doing a researching early New England diaries, and this grew out of a graduate school project. And I was um, disappointed to discover how few women's diaries from the period were available for study. Um, this is, of course, because many were, had been lost to time, but also because many women of the period uh, could read but couldn't write. So in the 17th, early 18th century, it was believed that Everyone should be taught to read so they could read their Bible, but writing was looked upon as a specialized job-related skill that was necessary for men to conduct business and not really necessary to be taught to girls. So as a result, not many of the not many women of the period had either the time or the ability to keep a diary. So when in the course of my research, I came across a volume of extracts taken from Mehitable Chandler Coit's diary that had been published by her descendants in 1895, I was immediately intrigued and began to wonder whether the original manuscript might still exist, um, particularly since historians generally believe that no 17th century diary by an American woman has survived. And Mehitable's diary has about a dozen pre-1700 entries uh, in the diary. So, you know, it's conceivably one of the earliest uh, American diaries written by an American woman to have survived. So when I started looking for Hannibal's diary, the descendants who had edited the volume of extracts wrote that at that time, um, in 1895, that the diary remained in family hands. So I hoped that this might still be the case, and I began compiling a family tree to see how it may have descended through the generations. And at the same time, I began contacting a number of museums and libraries to see if they might have the diary. Early on, I made the fortunate decision to get in touch with Yale University. Yale didn't have the diary, but they did have two of Mehitable's letters that had appeared in the volume of extracts. And they also had a treasure trove of about two dozen letters written by her mother, mother-in-law, sister, daughter, and friend between 1688 and 1743. And this is a really rare collection of early women's writings that not only shed a lot of light on Mehitable's experiences, but also provides a lot of insights into early American. American life. So Yale's records said that the letters had been donated over a period of time beginning in the 1950s by a New York woman named Elizabeth Anderson, and that at that time, Elizabeth Anderson was also the owner of the diary, although they misidentified the diarist as Mehitable's daughter, Martha. And the record said that Elizabeth Anderson had died in 1950. So I started looking for her obituary, figuring that this would provide the names of her heirs and thus possible owners of the diary, but I couldn't find any record of her death. And by this time, I had figured out where she belonged on the family tree. She was the great granddaughter of the diary volume editor's brother. And the, the diary volume editors were actually Mehitable Coit's great, great granddaughters. So I decided to take a step backwards and look for Elizabeth, Elizabeth Anderson's parents' obituaries, hoping that they might provide some helpful information. So her father had died in 1939, and um, as a result, his obituary wasn't very helpful. But her mother had died in 1964, and her obituary contained the revelation that Elizabeth Anderson was still living at the time. So evidently, Yale's records had been wrong about her death in 1950. So the obituary said that at that time, Elizabeth was living in a small town in upstate New York, and on a whim, I decided to contact the assessor's office in that town to ask how I might find out when Elizabeth's house had sold, figuring that that information would bring me closer to her actual date of death. And amazingly, the clerk in the assessor's office was able to tell me right away that the house had sold in the 1980s, and she was also able to provide me with the name and number of the buyer, a local realtor who happened to have been a friend of Elizabeth's. 
So I called up the buyer. He told me that he and Elizabeth had stayed in touch for several years, but he hadn't heard from her in about four years, and that she had, he knew she had moved to Pennsylvania, and he suggested I speak to his wife, that she might know more. So called up his wife. She hadn't spoken to Elizabeth any more recently, but she was able to put me in contact with Elizabeth's former handyman, who uh, provided the reassuring information that her cemetery plot remained unfilled, and he also put me in touch with her former housekeeper. So the housekeeper had been in contact with Elizabeth as recently as a year before and was able to confirm the name of the assisted living facility where Elizabeth had gone to live. So I contacted the assisted living facility, asked to speak to the social worker, and was informed, much to my delight, that at 95, Elizabeth was still alive. So the social worker suggested I write Elizabeth a letter rather than trying to speak to her on the phone because she was hard of hearing. And although my immediate impulse was to jump on a plane and go see her, I was ultimately glad I heeded the social worker's advice because Elizabeth ended up not being quite sure what she had done with the diary. She thought she might have donated it to Yale along with the family letters. So this was a very discouraging development, but then the social worker put me in contact with Elizabeth's closest relatives, a cousin and his wife living on Long Island. Called up the cousin's home. His wife answered the phone. I explained why I was calling, and she said, oh, I have that diary right here. So this was very exciting, and what was equally thrilling was that when the couple soon sent me a copy of the original manuscript, I saw that it contained a wealth of material not included in the published extracts. There were poems and medical remedies and recipes, and all this information really helped round out a picture of Mahitable's story, as well as adding to the historical significance of the diary. And I do have to say, one of the, another way that the original manuscript differed from the volume of extracts was that, in many ways, the entries did not appear chronologically, but rather appear to have been organized thematically. So one page might have entries relating to journeys that Mahidwal or members of her family had taken. Another page might have entries relating to the launchings of her husband's ships. But the very specific nature of the dates confirmed that they were recorded at or very close to the actual time of the event. And I took the diary's inscription, which was Mahitable Coit 1714, to indicate that Mahitable acquired this particular volume in 1714 and then copied into it entries from an earlier journal or a collection of scraps of paper. So that is the story behind finding the diary. Wow, I didn't know that that story was that involved. I mean, you were sh truly passionate about this subject that you were willing to put in all that genealogical research and effort into tracking it down. Yeah, it was it was amazing that it actually worked out. And, um, you know, it's just so fortunate that everyone, all these different people I talked to along the way were willing to help me out and, you know, that it had such a happy conclusion. Now, when you re you receive photo stats or pictures of the diary, but have you ever seen the original? I mean, what does that diary look like? And yes. what made yes. you, I mean, I guess we've already covered, you know, what made you want to write about the book, but it seems very special. Yeah, it is. Um, so, the, you know, originally um, the, the couple sent me copies, you know, Xerox copies of the, the uh, book, but then I did go see the original and it's, um, it's about three and a half inches by five and a half inches. It's leather, uh, leather covered covered volume. Um, it's, you know, it shows its age, but it's in very good condition. They take great care of it. And um, in fact, I, one of the talks I did in, I did a talk in New London um, and the diary owner came out from Long Island and brought the diary. So that was, you know, fun for people to see that. But um, yeah, it's just, it, it really is a remarkable document. And, um, you know, another caveat for the diary is that it's, it's a life record. Medwell kept it from the first entry dates from 1688 and the final entry from the final dated entry from 1749, but it's not by any means a daily record. It's only about 50 pages long, and the entries are very brief. They focus almost exclusively on external events, and they show very little emotion or introspection. And this is because the Puritans, and Mahitable was a Puritan, 
believe their diaries were proper places to record their daily activities, but also to document the ways God worked in the world around them. They really saw everything as being part of a divine plan, even the most ordinary of occurrences, such as changes in the weather or births and deaths in the community. And they favored a very plain style of language because they believed it was best for seeking spiritual truth. And the diary form that we're familiar with today really didn't start to develop until after the revolution when the new nation began to develop an appreciation for the arts. People began to explore the diary's opportunities for self-expression. And as society became more secular and more appreciative of the qualities of the individual, people began to use diaries as tools for self-exploration. So these, you know, these were challenges uh, for researching the Hittable story because her entries are so brief. But, um, you know, it, did, it, take, it took a lot of research. The research and writing process um, took about 10 years. But it really paid off because I was able to provide a lot of context for her um, very brief entries. And um, it really tried to flesh out her life as much as possible because I realized that this was a very rare opportunity to have this uh, life record from one woman from this time period. And so I really did try to delve into as much of her life, uh, as many aspects of her life as possible. And um, it, it was amazing once I did start the research, just more information kept turning up. And that kind of goes to my a point I always make is that even though certain groups of people may be challenging to research, I've, I've found in different projects I've, I've been involved in that once you do start to research, you do come across leads that lead you to other sources. And if you're kind of creative in looking for sources, you might be surprised at what you're able to find out. Let's talk about the life of the diarist. Who mm -hmm. was Mehetable Chandler Coit? What can you tell us about her life and accomplishments? Yes, so Mehetable was born in 1673 in Roxbury, Mass, near Boston. And when she was about 14, she and her family became some of the first settlers of Woodstock, Connecticut. And then... Uh, when she was about 21, she followed her brother and his family when they moved to New London, Connecticut. And there she met and married a successful shipbuilder named John Coit. They had six children together, lived a relatively comfortable life until John's death in 1744. And Mehitable lived the final 14 years of her, her life. Uh, as a widow. She died in 1758 at the age of 85. And so that's, that's the bare skeleton of Mahitable's life. But she, you learn from her writings and the family writings that um, she really did live a full life. In addition to running a household and raising a family, she read, she wrote, she traveled. There are financial accounts in the diary indicating that she engaged in a wide variety of economic exchanges with people in her community, both men and women, and letters that her daughter Martha wrote to her from Boston and Newport in the 1720s indicate that she had a wide range of acquaintances in both of these places, even though she had never lived in either location for any period of time. And it's unclear how she made these connections, but they were evidently very important to her and they served to link her to a wider world. And uh, another way to get to know Mahidwal is through Actually, the most basic way to get to know Mahidwal is through her writings. And I was very surprised at the range of writings in the diary. We have recipes. We have medical remedies. We have um, excerpts from poems. We have, there's even a little humor. Um, I, I thought it was interesting that she definitely is paying attention to current political events. Only there are a few references in her writings. Uh, for example, she writes, one of her earliest entries is April 18th, 1689, the revolution at Boston. And here, of course, she's referring to the coup that Bostonians staged following the deposing of James II, following the invasion of England by William of Orange and his wife, Mary. And as we know, the colonists greatly disliked James because of, he had arbitrarily replaced their elected form of government with a royally appointed governor and council. And his first appointee as royal governor, Sir Edmund Andros, came in and instituted a number of sweeping changes. He imposed new taxes. He restricted town meetings. He really curtailed the colonists' political liberties. So even before they had received official confirmation of William and Mary's having taken the throne. The citizens of Boston arrested and imprisoned Andros, and this is a move that would inspire another group of 
Boston Patriots generations later. So Middle takes note of this event in her diary. And although she doesn't record her feelings about the event, elsewhere in her diary, there's a poem that begins, for the few hours of life allotted me, grant me great God, but bread and liberty. And these lines are taken from a well-known essay of the time called Of Liberty by a writer named Abraham Cowley. And Cowley begins his essay with the proposition that the liberty of a people consists in being governed by laws that they have made themselves, the liberty of a private man in being master of his own time and actions. And I think it's pretty amazing that within the context of the patriarchal society in which she lived, Mahidwal was engaging with Kelly's ideas about personal and political freedom. And I think it indicates that other women of the time, although they were excluded from the political process, were also engaging with these concepts as well. And uh, just one last thing about Mahidwal as a person, there's a great little line um, anecdotal line in the extract, uh, the volume of extracts from her diary um, dating from 1895, where the descendants write, there's a traditional remembrance of the Hittable Chandler Coit as a person of unusual power, mentally and physically. So I thought that was, that's an intriguing uh, character, characterization. And then Mahidable's 21st century descendants uh, have come to refer to her as the incredible Mahidable. <laughs> You mentioned that Mahedable grew up in Roxbury, Massachusetts, but Mm -hmm. then she and her family moved to New Roxbury, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us why many early Americans decided that they would leave a settled area like Roxbury for the frontier of New New Roxbury and Connecticut? And can you describe each of those locations, like where is she living and then where is she moving? What do they sure. Like? So, um, yes, and you said um, New Roxbury, and that's what the settlement of Woodstock was originally called, New Roxbury. Um, so Roxbury, Mass., um, was a very, it was a wealthy community. It was very close to Boston at the time. It was home to many of the um, elite. Uh, it was a, a lovely town. Um, Mahibble's family was not among the elite. They were in the middling classes, but they were definitely social, socially upwardly mobile. Uh, they moved to Woodstock because it's why many other people moved at that time for land and opportunities. And so once they did move to Woodstock, New Roxbury, um, her uh, father and her brother were able to acquire vast tracts of land. And they also became selectmen and they became very prominent in town government. Her father became a deacon. So they were really, really upwardly mobile. Now, Mahidabal and her mother and her sister, on the other hand, had a very different experience because in Roxbury, they would have had access to many consumer goods because they were close to Boston. They had a a well-established home. They had access to hired help to help them around with the, around the house with the different household chores. But they went to New Roxbury and there weren't many people settled in that area at the time. So of course there was uh, not much in the way of options as far as either hired help or consumer goods. So they had to produce everything on their own or do without for the most part. There were some traders that went back and forth between New Roxbury and Boston, but of course this would uh, have taken some time. And they were isolated from other family members and friends. So I I think um, this is one of the major reasons why Mahidabal chose to leave when she was about 21 and go with her brother to New London. We know that her sister, Sarah, writes to her, Later on, when New Roxbury is experiencing difficulty with the Indians, um, the reasons people had moved out to New Roxbury, Woodstock, uh, to begin with, was that after King Philip's War, the local Indians had left the area, and it uh, offered uh, wonderful agricultural land, and it still is a very agricultural community. But then Indians started coming back, and of course, later conflicts developed, and so um, the New Roxbury was in a position of just really having to fend for itself. It was in a position of great difficulty. There was a point where um, some Indians attacked a family in Oxford, which was the nearest community, and killed several members of the family. The remaining members of the family escaped to Woodstock, and um, the people of Woodstock put out a call for help to the Massachusetts government. Uh, at this time, 
New Roxbury would would stop was still part of the of Massachusetts later it became part of Connecticut and um, help was very slow in coming and the people were ordered to stay put because they had to defend the community so they they were in a very difficult position and at one point when Hiddle was married and living in New London her sister Sarah writes to her have you forgotten garrison fears you who are now in prosperity um, and ironically Hiddle must have been asked Sarah to come visit her in New London because shortly thereafter, Sarah was married to Mehitable's husband, John's brother. So so it seems like you move for prosperity, but at least in the 17th century, it comes as a at a real price, which is, you know, your safety and, and comfort. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a really rest, hard life. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You mentioned that Mehetable married John Coit of New London, Connecticut. She marries him about, what, June 25th, 1695. Would you mm-hmm. tell us about the match? You know, who was John Coit? How did he and Mehetable meet? And while we're on the subject, what are early New England courtship rituals like? Okay. So Mehetable probably met John Coit through family members that she had in New London. Members of her mother's family had settled, were among the early settlers of New London. And that's likely how she met him. He, as I said, he was a successful shipbuilder. He came from a shipbuilding family. And for many years, his family shipyard was the largest in New London. So they're, they're very well to do. Um, we don't, unfortunately, have any surviving writings between Mehitable and John Coit, which is unfortunate because it would have been great to f- find some insight into their relationship. Um, but basically, during this time period, uh, love was considered to be integral to the success of a marriage. Um, and, you know, we have kind of a stereotype that some people still kind of believe in that marriages were arranged and they were arranged at a very early age. And, and both of those stereotypes are untrue. Um, Mehitable was married in her early 20s, as were most brides of this time period. Um, cer- certainly there were exceptions. One of her sisters married at 16. But, um, you know, girls typically married or women typically married in their early 20s and men were typically a couple of years older. So love was very considered very important to a match at the time. Um, and social rank was considered extremely important. You wanted to marry someone who was within the same um, social, uh, was of the same social status as you were. Um, so Mandible's family and John Coit's family came from a similar social status, um, and they were also very involved in the local church. Um, now, although marriages weren't arranged, parental sanction was considered very important. People did want their parents' blessing. And so it seems that this was very likely given that um, John Coit's family and Mahidwell's mother's relatives traveled in the same social circles out in New London. Um, now, the, the courtship rituals were, of course, different from what we have today, but there was chances there were chances for socialization prior to a marriage uh, between a, you know couples who were courting. They would go to social events. They would see each other at each other's homes. Of course, this, these visits would typically be supervised. Um, and then we, uh, once they decided to marry, their parents would make some financial arrangements. Each set of parents would donate, uh, make some type of contribution to the couple to ensure that they were on a good footing when they started their married life together. Um, so I did say that love was very, considered very important to a marriage at this time, and marriages were seen as a partnership. However, the man was always considered the head of this partnership, and a woman entered into the married state very um, – she did not enter into the married state very lightly because once she did so, she would become – enter femme covert status. Basically, her identity and her legal rights would be subsumed under those of her husband. So it was not a step that one took lightly. It's unfortunate we don't – we don't have any writings between the two when we have so many writings between Mahitable and the female members of her family. So we can get insight into those relationships, but not really into the relationship between her and John Coit. They, they were married for a very long time. Um, I think it was uh, 60 years. When I, want, I want to say 60 years. Um, no. It's probably about 50 years. Um, so one hopes they had a good relationship because it was a very long-standing relationship. There are some listener questions that have been submitted about what life was like for Mehetable and other women like her, just in terms of 
you know, their daily lives. So once Mehetabel married John Coint, she became the woman of the house. And Shirley's would like to know what chores or social activities average women like Mehetabel would have performed on a typical day. Um, oh, there were many, to be sure. Even if you were a, um, a well-to-do person and could afford help, um, which I want to return to that point in a minute. But um, basically, there was a great pressure on women of this period to be considered notable housewives, that they were capable of accomplishing a wider range of tasks in the household efficiently and economically. So there were, it was not only the um, responsibility for overseeing meals and kitchen gardens and livestock and um, sewing and cooking and cleaning and candle making. It, you know, the list is seemingly endless. Um, but many women did, were able to have some help. Um, some had hired help and some had slaves. Uh, and Mehitable and her husband were the owners of four slaves that we know of, Nanny, Nell, Mingo, and Peter. And Mingo and Peter likely helped John Coit with his work at the shipyard um, and perhaps, you know, uh, just uh, basic house, household work, um, outdoor household work, you know, around the farm. Um, but Nanny and Nell would have helped Mehitable with child care and with just domestic, basic domestic work, and probably, um, in particular, Nell, who was younger, um, helped uh, probably with the most disagreeable tasks, you know, the hardest, dirtiest tasks, because why would you do them yourself if you had a slave who could do them for you? So um, this is something that, you know, needs to be considered when we think about, you know, Mabel's workload was heavy, yet she did have this assistance. Um, And I think, Going to kind of veering off on a different point, the fact that considering that she did have this very heavy workload, as did all women of the time, I think it is amazing that she was able to continue to keep her diary throughout her life. And although the, you know, it's not, her diary is not like a 19th century diary where um, you see 19th century diaries where women pour out their hearts and their feelings. It's, it's not that type of a diary. But the fact that she was able to maintain this commitment to her diary, I think, is pretty amazing. And um, I, one important point I did want to make about Mahidabal as a diarist was that she probably got her love of writing from her mother, Elizabeth Douglas Chandler. And when I was researching the Hiddle story, it was very, um, it was at the very end of the process. I had finished the research and writing, and I went to the Yale archives to make sure nothing relating to Mahidable had escaped my notice. And there I found a 64-page poem written by her mother, uh, probably completed about 1681. It's called A Meditation or Poem, Being an Epic of the Experiences and Conflicts of a Poor Trembling Soul in the First 40 Years of Her Life. So it's basically a um, narrative of Elizabeth Douglas Chandler's spiritual development. And as I said, probably completed about 1681 when she was 40. And it's it's an amazing piece of writing. And then after I finished the book, uh, I was contacted by a descendant in uh, a retired attorney in Seattle who happens to have a 17th century letter book that appears to have been kept by Elizabeth Douglas Chandler as well. And this is only 18 pages, and it's um, a very idiosyncratic document. It contains letters uh, both sent and received by Elizabeth Douglas Chandler. Um, However, not all of these letters appear to have, she doesn't appear to have been either the original author or recipient of several of them. And a number of them are love letters. Um, And the authors of some of these letters are signed with an initial and some not not at all. So it just, um, there's a lot of documentation in the family that supports that this was Elizabeth Chandler's letter book, but it really presents a whole different side to her character. And uh, again, just the fact that these women took the time out of their very busy lives to preserve these writings, I think is amazing. And I think that the recovery of the diary, the letters, the poem, and the letter book, I think it's a really strong indication of the that other women's writings of this period that have been forgotten, overlooked, or misidentified may yet come to light. And I think that hopefully with the development of new online uh, research tools and finding aids and specialized databases that they might become that much easier to locate. 
How typical was it for an early American or early New England family to own one or more slaves? And how did families integrate the slaves into their households? Do they have separate houses for them, like on a plantation? So those are very good questions. Um, it was it was pretty typical um, in sea seaport areas for families to have slaves. Of course, they would. They, it was nothing like southern slavery, where there were large plantations with um, many many slaves. Uh, typically, a house might have one or two black servants, um, and the they were housed. Um, their living quarters were in the house with the family. So this type of paternalistic system developed and where the slaves were considered part of the family as were you know, white servants. And yet, of course, they were not considered to be on the same level as um, flesh and blood family members or even the white servants. It was a, a less harsh system up here, but it was still a very harsh system because of course, any system where you're deprived of your of your personal freedom um, or your right to be with your family is very harsh. Um, we know that Mingo and Peter were married. We, it does not seem that they lived with their wives, so they were clearly separated from their families. And now we're not sure whether she ever married or had children, but John Coit, when he made his will in the 1740s, after Nell had been with the family for almost 30 years, writes that he would give his Negro woman Nell to Mehitable unless he decided to sell said Negro woman. So there's, they lived this very precarious existence where, um, you know, even after being with a family for, uh, decades, there's still the possibility that you could be sold. Um, and New London had a lot of um, had a lot of slaves and uh, some black free people in its population because of its involvement with um, the maritime trades and, of course, the triangular trade, where you know at its uh, most basic level, rum would be brought to from New England to Africa to be uh, exchange for slaves who were brought to the West Indies who were sold and exchanged for the molasses and, and sugar came from the West Indies uh, and then brought back up to New England to make more rum. And of course, some of the slaves came up to New England on these voyages too. They didn't remain behind in the West Indies. So um, one really helpful source in researching the slaves of New London, London was Joshua Hempstead's diary. He was Mahitable's near neighbor and um, actually a distant cousin, and he kept a diary dating from 1711 to 1758 that's been published. It's much more of a, a daily record than Mahitables is, and it provides a lot of information about the slaves who um, lived in New London. And he actually provides a lot of information about Mahitables' family, and ironically, the final entry in his diary is old Mrs. Mahitable Coit died today, and then he himself died a couple of weeks later. Wow. Well, we have so many different things to talk about, but before we get to the time warp, um, I'd like to try and get to a, just a few more listener questions. One listener would like to know about childbirthing and what it was like in the late 17th and early 18th century. And as Mehetable had several children, who would have seen her through her labor and deliveries? Would it have been Nell? Uh, very good question. So, um, yes, yeah, so childbirth uh, was a, a communal event, as many other rites of passage in early America were. So uh, Mahitable, when she was ready to give birth, would have been surrounded by neighbors, family members. Um, she had been, she was done with child uh, bearing by the time Nell came into the household. But, uh, you know, there would have been a lot of people in that house when she was ready to have a baby. Um, of course, it was a very a dangerous event. It was, there were a lot of um, there was a lot of risk for both the mother and the infant, um, not only during the process of the actual childbirth, but then afterwards. Uh, there was a great risk of postpartum infection, and that actually killed more people than uh, actual the actual labor did. Now, uh, what's really interesting is Mahitable's mother-in-law, Martha Coit, left behind a childbirth testimonial dated from 1681 that talks about how she goes into each experience of 
uh, labor, just being really fearing for her life and how she trusts God will uh, will deliver her from this experience. And yet she is still overcome with doubt and fear. And then how God brings her through each episode. Um, and this she left to her children to be an instructive um, letter to trust in God at all times. But I, I'm sure Mahidabal saw this, this document. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to consider how she might have related to it, um, what her fears might have been at that time. Wow, it's tough to imagine, especially today when we have hospitals and, and other things that make childbirthing uh, just so much drugs. safer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, drugs. Monique would like to know how much influence an average woman like Mahedable would have had over her husband. And when she sent this question, she specifically referenced how historians like to describe the influence Abigail Adams had on the ideas and opinions of her husband, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, that was a, Abigail and John Adams was a true partnership. We we don't you know, we don't know unless um, you know we can't really make assumptions about Mahedable and John's relationship or other relationships of that time, unless we find some documentation. Um, and there is, you know, you, you do see letters between married couples and um, that are full of endearments and testify that they had this really close relationship. Um, of course, you know, you would, you would assume that after being married for decades and your, your wife is serving as your helpmeet, that you would trust her counsel. Uh, in Mahidabal's case, she we know she kept accounts on her, her own behalf. Um, she talks about trading different items, cloth and clothing and rum, um, but that she also kept some accounts on her husband's behalf. So she was assisting him. She was what, you know, there's a common term of a wife acting as a deputy husband during this time period. And so she was definitely assisting him in his rep record keeping. Um, she documents the shipyard workers, apprentices who come to stay with the family over a period of time. And um, she also makes notations about different ships that are launched from the shipyard. So she's paying close attention to the business. And it's very likely that John Coit was aware she was helping him in this in this way and appreciated her help. But I really, you know, I, I can't testify to their relationship because of all of the material and information uh, in detail, I was able to uncover about different aspects of Mahidabal's life. The one thing lacking is that, um, you know, anything really that testifies to their relationship, other than John Coit's will, um, he did leave uh, good provision for her when he died to make sure that she would be taken well care of. Uh, but th that's really the only the only written document from John Coit that I uh, was able to locate. And it's actually interesting, this family, through the generations, really treasured the women's writings, but the, the men's writings are kind of few and far between until you get to the 19th century. You know, it's interesting because in episode 18, Danielle Allen, who wrote Our Declaration, and in episode 7, Sarah Giorgini, who's an assistant editor at the Adams Papers, both of these scholars mentioned that one of the reasons we know so much about John and Abigail Adams is they spent so much time apart. So that's why we right. have the documentary trail. So I wonder mm -hmm. how many times you were like, I wish Mahedable and John spent more time apart so yeah. I'd have letters. <laughs> but I mean, I'd I like guess, to have something, yeah. You know, those long distance relationships yeah. weren't typical. Most right. married couples stayed together for a long time. Before we move on to the time warp, one last question. Teresa would like to know how early American women did their laundry. You know, she's wondering, you know, in the 17th and 18th century, you didn't typically have running water in your house. So where do you get the water and do you wash inside the house or in a, in a river? Right. Uh, I think it varied. Um, you know, I think it entailed getting, this would be one of the most unpleasant chores. And this is something that Nell would be doing because it's a lot of heavy lifting it's a lot of, uh, you know, it has a lot of different steps of getting the water. I think the people got the water, got the water from wells and um, brought it to the home and then heated it over the fire so that, you know, you would have hot water for washing. Um, but, you know, just, it was just very, it was backbreaking work carrying the big pails of water and then just dealing with the heavy wet clothes. So, yes, I, that would be something that Nell definitely would have helped with. Well, thank you for taking the time to answer our questions, but now it is time for the Time Warp. The Time Warp. 
historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Are you ready for your question, Michelle? I'm ready. What if Mehetable had kept more detailed entries in her diary, or if she had updated her diary more often? What would you like to know about her life that you don't already know? Or perhaps, what would you like to know more about the lives of early New England women in general? Uh, well, there are a, a lot of mysteries still remaining about Mehetable's life. Um, different information I came across that I, I wasn't able to find additional details about that I did have questions about. For example, uh, the Reverend Cotton Mather, you know, very well-known Boston minister, uh, notes in his church records in May of 1693 that he admits a Mehitable Chandler. And there's much possibility surrounding the fact that this could be our Mehitable, that she may have been back in Boston during this time period. Um, but there's really no way of knowing for sure. And the fact that Mehitable never officially joined another church, she was very close to the minister in New London and his wife, and she was very religious and very involved in the local church, uh, but she never officially joined, and that's surprising, and that leads me to believe that she likely did join Cotton Mather's church um, and just never officially was dismissed from the church, which would have enabled her to join another church. Uh, another mystery uh, surrounding her life that I would like answered is her daughter writes to her from Newport in 1722, I believe it was, I hear you have had Ben Uncas to visit you. And Ben Uncas was the leader of the Mohegan Indians, which was the largest tribe in Connecticut. They lived in the New London area. And there's really no telling why Ben Uncas would have been to visit Mehitabal. I'd love to know the reason behind that. Um, and finally, I'd like to know why uh, in her diary, when Mehitabal records the her entry about Nell coming into her household, she writes, Nell came here in September in 1717, she then being 20 years of age. And then she writes Nell with these two long dashes after it. And it's really unlike anything else in the diary. And it leads me to believe she wanted to record something more about Nell, but found herself unable to articulate her thoughts. And I'd love to know what she wanted to say about Nell. Of course, I'd also love to know what Nell might have said about her. Uh, and I'd love to know more about the four slaves in general. And of course, um, you know, if her diary had been more detailed, uh, I'd like to know how she felt about her life. Um, and that's something that I'd like to know about early New England women in general. How did they feel about their lives? You know, you get a lot of external detail, um, but the the intimate thoughts and feelings you really can only get from letters that survive at the time. So, um I, that's what I hope to continue researching, how, how to, find, to find out more about how these women did feel about their lives. Well, good luck with that. And before we conclude, would you tell us about what you're working on now, how you're working to get at how early New England women felt about their lives, and perhaps if and when we can visit Abigail Adams' birthplace? Yes. So um, I, I serve on the board of the Abigail Adams Birthplace, and uh, the birthplace is open um, various times during the year. The uh, open hours are on the website, which is abigailadamsbirthplace.com, and um, we always welcome visitors. Feel free to like us on Facebook. Uh, and we have recently done some major programming there. We'll have more programs coming up soon, but we did a program recently on the slaves that uh, belonged to Abigail Adams's father and what it was like for her growing up in a slave owning household. And we also uh, did the latest in a series of Women's History Month author panels. This one was on trailblazing women, and it was on Anne Hutchinson, Margaret Fuller, and Amelia Earhart. And as far as my own writing, I have uh, an article coming out about Abigail Adams's maternal grandparents, the Reverend John and Mary Mason Norton, that will be coming out in uh, American Ancestors, which is the magazine of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And I am working on a book on Penelope Pelham Winslow. And she was the wife of Plymouth Colony Governor Josiah Winslow. Uh, she's a fascinating figure because she lived part of her life in England, uh, part of her life in New, 
New England. She survived both the English Civil War and King Philip's War, and I plan to look at her life in connection with different family members as well as servants and slaves owned by that family. So there's a lot of connections. Um, there's a lot of connections that can be drawn there, and it's proving to be a fascinating project. And she survived the transatlantic crossing, which is not yep. something More I, than once. <laughs> I would have survived with my stomach contents in place. <laughs> Um, so where is the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? Yes. Yeah, so, and, um, and I'm continuing to do uh, different talks, um, and these are listed on my website, which is onecolonialwomansworld.com. Okay, and we'll include a link for that in the show notes page. So thank you so much for joining us and telling us all about Mehetable Chandler Coit and for answering our questions, Michelle. We enjoyed it. All right. Thank you very much, Liz. I, I enjoyed it myself. Thank you. Mehetable Chandler Coit was an everyday woman, and yet she was also remarkable in that she kept a diary. As Michelle revealed, many early American women could read, but very few could write, because early Americans believed you only needed to know how to write if you were going to practice business, which is not an opportunity that most early American women had. Of course, as we know, not having an opportunity to practice business does not mean that early American women didn't work hard. Michelle provided us with many examples of the hard work that women performed around their households to keep them running when she kindly answered all of our questions. You can find more information about Michelle, her book, One Colonial Woman's World, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode. You'll find it all at benfranklinsworld.com slash zero three two. Do you enjoy and love this podcast? Please tell your friends and family about it. The best way to make Ben Franklin's world visible and findable for our fellow history lovers is for us to tell them about the show. So when you arrive at your destination, walk by or chat with your fellow dog walkers or joggers, or the next time you call or email your grandmother, please tell them about Ben Franklin's world. And finally, what more would you like to know about the everyday lives of men and women in early America? Email me your questions to liz at benfranklinsworld.com or tweet me at Liz Covart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.